Welcome to our live webcast, Opioid Sparing Pain Relief for C-Sections. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kai Taylor, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A polling window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the top where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to, to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. During this presentation, you will see multiple choice polling questions throughout the event. When a poll is active, it will automatically appear in the Q&A polling window. To participate in the polls, please select the buttons to the left of the answers that best represent your views or experiences. We are joined today by our moderator, Mike Wells, Director of Medical Education, Avenos, and our speaker, Dr. Anita Samani, for Comprehensive Women's Care Practice in Columbus, Ohio. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Mike Wells, for opening remarks. Thank you, Kai. It's my pleasure to introduce our clinician speaker today. Dr. Samani is a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio and completed her OBGYN residency at Mount Carmel Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. She is board certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Her clinical practice specializes in obstetrics and gynecology and she has a special interest in minimally invasive surgery along with robotic surgical procedures. Dr. Samani is an American College of Obstetrics and Gynecological Fellow, a past president of the Columbus OBGYN Society, a member of the Academy of Medicine and the Ohio State Medical Association, a board member of the St. Anne's Perinatal Peer Review and past board member of the Knightsbridge Surgery Center. She has served as a delegate and alternate delegate to the Ohio State Medical Association. This evening, Dr. Samani will review her clinical techniques as it relates to opioid sparing pain relief for C-sections. Thank you all for your engagement and participation in advance, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Anita Samani. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's listening. I know it's sometimes very awkward to hear a voice just coming at you with no body, no face, no, um, no other feedback other than the voice. So please feel free to interrupt me with questions. I'm always um, interested in hearing other people's perspectives. And one of the first questions that I had that I think is um, on their mic is, how many people are already actively using the on cue pump? If the audience so, could take advantage of the poll window that's open to you now, please select yes or no to our question. Are you currently utilizing the on cue pain relief system in your clinical practice for your patient's post-surgical pain control? So it takes a moment or two, Dr. Samani, for this information to populate. If you'd like to move forward, I'll provide you with some poll results very soon. Yep, absolutely. So how did I get involved with on cue? As, as you can go to the next slide. Um, I am obviously a paid speaker for Avanos, and the reason I am a paid speaker for them is because I believe in the product. Um, we started using the on cue pain pump back in 2011. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that we started it, and one of the reasons that I think it would be certainly something I would encourage everyone to consider is that at that time, Ohio was sort of in the midst of a opioid epidemic. We were looking at ways to decrease costs for our robotic patients. Um, if, you, if you all understand how pain works, sometimes the first exposure to pain medication is typically what then leads to an addiction to pain medicine. And oftentimes people will say, well, I got addicted to narcotics or I got addicted to pain medicine because I was prescribed them for an injury or for a surgery or for post-operative care after a repair of an injury. So that was where we started looking. And then the other reason we started looking at alternative pain management was we were trying to get our patients home is we were getting pushback from the hospital and from other people about the cost of robotics. And we felt if we could cut down on hospital care, which is usually the most expensive piece of somebody's surgery, then we could improve 
the total cost of the surgery. So that was one of the main reasons that we started looking into this. Our orthopedic colleagues were already using the on cue pump for hip replacements and for shoulders. And so it seemed like a, a natural extension to talk to them about it and say, okay, so what have you seen with this? How has it helped? How has it not helped? And so our first cases were actually with our robotic um, gynecologic patients. Those patients were oftentimes um, coming in for a variety of surgeries. We were doing endometriosis resection, myomectomies for patients who had been dealing with infertility. We were doing hysterectomies. So it was a wonderful alternative. And we started also getting more questions from our patients about what can we do? We've heard you know, that um, narcotics are bad for you or I don't wanna take pain, pain medicine, I'm afraid of getting addicted. And the problem with that is that if you aren't taking pain medicine, you're also then not moving around because it hurts to move. So we really wanted to encourage movement. We wanted to get patients out of the hospital in a reasonable time frame, And we wanted to decrease the amount of opioids that people were using and potentially long-term prevent um, narcotic dependence. Next slide. Um, so is pain becoming more difficult to treat and what is influencing how we manage patients in an acute care setting? So pain is very subjective. As you all know, um, pain is not something we can quantify. We try to quantify it with our pain scales. And sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it isn't. But part of the reason pain is becoming more difficult to treat is that there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress that plays into this. Um, sometimes people are already coming to us having been on antidepressants or other medications that influence the pain receptors and that also then leads to increased narcotic use. And then how do we manage patients? You know, um, the big thing, and it's, there's pros and cons to this, right? You know, there's the advantage of being able to say, well, we can only prescribe a certain amount of narcotics. You know, our, our laws have changed in Ohio. We can only give you a seven day course. So we can limit how much we give in the way of narcotics. But on the other hand, patients whose pain is not adequately treated also can be dissatisfied by the care that they receive. Next slide. So um, what, are, what are some risks? You know, what are the, the things that are associated with the opioid-related death epidemic? Addiction risks. So one in four people, 25% of people who are prescribed opioids progress to longer-term prescriptions. Um, patients who received an opioid prescription within seven days of surgery were almost 44, 45% more likely to become long-term opioid users within one year compared to those who received no such prescription. And the ones who go on to need a second prescription are even more likely. So 50% of people who use narcotic prescriptions for 30 days or longer were still using them three years later. And because there's a tolerance factor that develops, oftentimes these patients are needing higher and higher doses to get the same pain relief. The other big thing when it comes to obstetrics is oftentimes a C-section or a vaginal delivery, but mostly a C-section is what we're focusing on. It's the first time a patient is experiencing any type of major surgery. So if that's their first exposure to surgery and they end up you know, becoming dependent on narcotics, then you can see the next step is they're gonna be in this potential of having a drug dependent baby. So I, this, these numbers shocked me, but every 19 minutes in the United States, a drug dependent baby is born. And I know that you all probably have had experience with it. We see it here in Columbus, Ohio. There's been a five-fold increase in the number of babies that are born in a drug-dependent state, most commonly opioid dependence. So we're having to deal then with opioid withdrawal in the NICU. These babies have um, a lot more complications in the immediate postpartum period. So those are some things that we really want to try and, and get a handle on and be able to decrease that risk to baby and the risk to mom. Next slide. Mike, next slide. So who is it gonna be? You know, how do we predict who's gonna end up being addicted? That's a little trickier. I don't think we have good um, data on that, but about 4,300 opioid naive women become persistent opioid users following a cesarean delivery. So if you think about it from the perspective of 30% of our deliveries nationally are C-sections, that's a pretty high number that generally will end up 
becoming dependent on, on um, narcotics. So with C-sections, we often in the past would give a 30-day prescription. We'd give 40 Percocet or we'd give you know, 35 or you know, whatever number someone was prescribing. But it was a much higher dosage than what we do now. And as a result, people would think, oh, they gave me 30 days worth. I've got to take all the pills. And they would continue to take the medication, even though they may not have needed it. Now, most of us are limited to doing, you know, a seven-day course of narcotics, or some states are even saying three-day course, which really is unrealistic. But um, what I'm finding with the, with the increased use of the on-Q pump is that our patients really are not needing to use Percocet. And we typically are sending them home with 10 to 15, and they'll come back when we see them and say, oh, I only use two or three of those. So that's been a, a significant decrease in terms of our, or a significant change in terms of our prescribing habits. Next slide. So this was a, um, this was a clinical summary that was um, released from the Sentinel event alert. And it, as you all know, hospitals have what they call Sentinel events. That can include things as far as like maternal death, um, an unplanned or a surgery that was on the wrong limb. You know, so there's certain things that are considered Sentinel events. And one of those were um, analgesics and how um, adverse drug events happen with these patients. And the most common was opioid-induced respiratory depression. Where we saw it the most were our high-risk patient populations, those who had sleep apnea, those who were morbid, morbidly obese. Now, when you think about our pregnant patients, oftentimes those are patients that do, that do fall into these two categories elderly and frail, the very ill children, and then those that are getting multiple drugs. So if you have patients that are already on, whether it be on antidepressants or anti-anxiolytic medications, those patients are gonna be more at risk for opioid-induced respiratory depression. So it's something to think about, again, as you're looking at what are you gonna prescribe, what are you gonna to give to your patients post-operatively. Next. So, um, what are the biggest opioid-related adverse effects and what happens in surgical patients? Um, most of them will have respiratory depression if they are given too much narcotic. Um, nausea and vomiting is something that's very common with these patients. Drowsiness, we, we see itching or you know, that generalized um, feeling of scratching themselves, oftentimes with Duramore, um, which the, our anesthesia colleagues will give in the spinal or give at the time that they're converting the epidural into a spinal, if this is somebody who's been in labor, altered mental status, and then constipation and paralytic ileus. So constipation is something that patients oftentimes will complain of. Um, Long-term paralytic ileus is pretty rare, but that also contributes to the higher readmission rates that we see. So one of the, one of the things that we don't use very often, but some people still use are the, uh, um, the PCAs or the patient controlled analgesia. And even though there is, there are safety mechanisms in those, um, I know that at our hospital there, there are people that still get PCAs and the nurses get very frustrated because the alarms are going off, the apnea monitors are going off or the um, pulse oximeters are going off. So that definitely can create a little bit more of an issue for pain management, or not for pain management, but for patient care. So in terms of opioid-related adverse events, these patients were usually hospitalized longer, um, typically four days to seven and a half days. Now, it's rare to see patients hospitalized that long. Sometimes what will happen is they'll go home and then they'll have issues as far as constipation or a mild ileus or they may be nauseated. If they're you know, drowsy, it's gonna make it more difficult for them to care for their newborn. Um, Cost-wise, there's a $4,700 average increase in hospital cost, mostly related to the complications and the longer hospitalization. And then the readmission rate is typically for the GI side effects. Um, most of the other things are in the immediate phase, but the GI side effects are something that we can see later on. Next. Dr. Simone, there, in advance, there is a question that came from the audience. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know, do you see a positive response to this therapy consistently with at-risk patients? Patients that are already addicted to narcotics, is that the question? Correct. So our, um, our residents at Riverside Methodist have a opioid clinic for pregnant women, and that is a subset of people that they've started using the on-cue pump on.
and they are definitely seeing a difference in terms of those patients and their use of narcotics. Most of them when they're in the, in the opioid clinic are obviously are not, they're not, they're taking Suboxone. Um, so those patients, generally speaking, do very well. Now, the, the thing that's hard to measure, and it's one of those that's a little bit more challenging, is the secondary gain that comes from pelvic, from pain. So we have chronic pelvic pain patients, our endometriosis patients, that oftentimes, even though when you objectively um, go in on your rounds and you examine them and you're palpating their abdom abdomen, they don't respond in terms of pain, but they will verbalize that they're having pain. So that's one, that's one group that's a little more challenging, but even those patients will say, oh yeah, you know, I've had surgeries before and this really did make a difference. Um, for our patients that are in the um, opioid clinic, the ones that are really trying to stay clean, they often they oftentimes appreciate the fact that we're giving them a alternative to narcotics when it comes to surgery. So they're, you know, especially if they're motivated to stay off the drugs and they're using the Suboxone successfully and they're really trying to stay clean, those patients are much more likely to, to appreciate the alternatives and also um, objectively to have better, well, I shouldn't say objectively, subjectively to have better pain, pain relief or pain to or less use of the narcotics. We mm. also use Toradol um, for the first 24 hours. So that's something that we do as a routine. So that also helps. And there are, and we'll go through this, some of the slides that showed comparisons of using anti-inflammatories versus anesthetics for the use of the on-Q pump. Does that answer the question? I believe it does. Okay. So going on um, to the next slide. So breastfeeding. Again, you know, because there's been so much in the lay press and there's been so much talk about, you know, the, and up until COVID obviously took over every, every medical research article that you read, every journal, every newscast, you know, everything that we read now is about COVID. But prior to that, there was a huge push to look at how do we decrease opioid dependence in this country? How do we look at um, less prescriptions, um, alternatives to help patients who had chronic pain. Um, and so patients would come in, especially our pregnant patients, asking, well, what, are, what am I gonna get prescribed for my C-section? What can I do? How can I, um, can I breastfeed? Is that something I can do with narcotics? Um, now, one of the best things about the on pump is it's a localized effect. So we can really truly reassure them that none of that will cross into the breast milk. Um, breastfeeding and narcotics. And again, this is a double-edged sword. Some people actually like the idea that their baby's going to be a little drowsy and will sleep better at night. But the reality is we don't want infants to become drowsy or have CNS depression or um, the risk of death is extremely small, but newborns can be very sensitive to opioids. And, if, and since some of it does cross, to the breast, cross into the breast milk, we need to make our patients aware that that is a potential side effect that they need to um, manage, you know, the breastfeeding with the narcotic use. So I find that if I use Tordal and the OnQ, then we transition to oral anti-inflammatories. Their use of narcotics has gone down significantly. Most of our patients, as I said, we're giving them a prescription, but they're not using the prescription or they're not using yeah, they're using no IV narcotics in the hospital and very little oxycodone or Percocet. Next. So patient satisfaction. Um, one of the things that we all are judged on as hospitals and physicians are the press gamey scores. And one of the things that hospitals have found and studies have found is that there's a very high correlation between global satisfaction with your care and always receiving good pain control. And those patients also feel that they have a better relationship with staff if they're getting good pain control. So this is another thing that, you know, from a purely clinical standpoint, you don't want to think about, but when you think about it from the perspective of a hospital's press gaining scores or your own personal scores with everybody going on, you know, Google patient reviews or health grades or the different things that are out there to judge physicians, it is important to look at how can we manage a patient's pain better. Next. 
Next. So this, this is more from a uh, cost perspective, you know, not so much about press gaining scores, but reducing the length of stay. And if you all um, across the country are like we are in Columbus, Ohio, one of the big pushes was when this whole COVID pandemic started was to limit the use of hospital beds to keep those beds open in case we were overwhelmed with COVID cases. Now we've been very fortunate in Ohio, we were able to um, flatten the curve, we were able to um, actually keep our hospitals fairly empty. So we finally, after six weeks of not operating and doing elective cases, I'm finally back to being in the OR again, which is fa fabulous. But our C-sections never stopped, our pregnancy you know, deliveries never stopped. That, that continued to be a, you know, the case. So what we were doing and what patients were also starting to notice and find out was that they were able to go home sooner. When I look at our average length of stay over the last um, six to eight weeks since we started this whole COVID pandemic, most of our patients, most of our C-section patients have gone home within 48 hours. And that's something we had already started trending down towards. So we started with the on cue pain pump for GYN patients in 2011. In 2000, late 2013, 2014, we started seeing some patients that were, had had robotic surgery. They had had the endometriosis resection or they had had a myomectomy and then conceived. And now we were taking care of them through their pregnancy. And, and the first group that we worked with were the patients that had robotic myomectomies. And we knew they were gonna be scheduled C-sections. And what was truly interesting about it was when we were getting through the pregnancy and we were starting to think about scheduling C-sections, oftentimes the patients were asking now, are you gonna use that pump on me? Is that something you're gonna use for me? Because I really liked it before and I just wanna make sure I can get it for my C-section. So that was sort of the start of looking at it for obstetric use. And again, because of that whole issue of decreasing narcotic use and length of stay, we started thinking about it from that perspective, not just for patient satisfaction, but also the fact that patients were, had been satisfied enough to ask for it a second time. So after we started using it in those patients, we thought, well, who can we use it on that would be able to tell us if it really helps or not? And that was our repeat C-sections. So our next group of patients that we started on our, was our scheduled patients. So anybody who had a scheduled C-section, our nurses would sit down with them somewhere between 36 and 38 weeks and go through showing them the on-cue pump, showing them how it worked, what the process was, where it was positioned. You know, the, the company has great videos. They have a lot of patient support. So we were able to show them ahead of time what to anticipate. And that made it easier for the patients because it wasn't like we were putting it in right at the time of surgery and then they were trying to understand how to manage it. They had some time where they could understand, they could read up on it. And it helped from, this, um, from our, for our perspective, it helped with patient satisfaction because patients understood that we were trying to reduce their narcotic use and we were trying to give them a better way to manage their pain. Next slide. So post-operative wound irrigation. This was a, a study looking at irrigating with local anesthetic. This was prior to um, uh, placement, the, the, the current on-cue pump that we have. There was a, a different um, unit before that. And they looked at continuous local infusion um, versus no infusion, so just a, a placebo. And what they found was the patients actually did not have a difference in pain scores, but there was a reduction in the morphine consumption of the patient. So even though you would verbally ask them how their pain was, they would still say they were having pain, but when you assess them for use of narcotics, it was much lower. So there was no difference um, in their pain scores, which was interesting because you would think there would be, but the narcotic requirements were much less. Next slide. So visual analog scores, you can see here um, what the scores were at 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. Their scores were going down. So at 24 hours, they were four, you know, on a, on a, on a visual analog scale, they were four out of 10. And then um, as they got to two days, it dropped to two out of 10, plus or minus 1.7. 1, 1. Um, the first group is the control group. The second group is the placebo. 
And then um, their use of morphine, you can see, is definitely different. So at 12 hours, they were getting less morphine in the, in the control group versus the placebo. And also at 48 hours later, there was a significant difference. So next slide. So here, um, and these are various studies that were out of anesthesia. Um, they looked again in terms of pain scores. The pain scores were not different when they were resting in bed, but the patients who were up and moving around, they were able to move around quicker and they actually had lower pain scores when they were moving if they had gotten the patient control group for the pain versus um, not getting that at all versus getting a placebo. Next slide. Um, so what, what kind of the next step was looking at, okay, ripivacaine versus ketoprofen for the first 48 hours. And this, this particular study looked at comparing placement above and below the fascial layer. So if you think about your nerve receptors and where your pain receptors are, it, it makes sense that you would want to try and do it, you know, either in the peritoneal cavity or below the fascial layer as far as where the nerves are coming in. And then again, in terms of leakage, like if you guys are familiar with using the on -cue pump, sometimes one of the biggest complaints you'll get is that it's leaking and the nurses will call you and they're worried that it's not working well because it's leaking and the dressing is getting saturated. It still works well, it's just that less of the, the less volume of the anesthetic is absorbed. So we routinely put the catheters below the fascia in the peritoneal cavity. Because if you placed it um, above it, like in the subcutaneous fatty layer, you ended up getting a little bit more of that sort of, um, I guess, negative feedback that, oh, it's leaking, I don't really think it's working. Next slide. Um, so subfascial placement, and in this study looked at intermittent boluses compared to doing um, an epidural uh, duramore. So levobupivacaine is a long-acting um, anesthetic that's given in the epidural space. The subfascial placement of the, of the inc um, incisional catheter provided similar pain relief, patient satisfaction, and total oxycodone rescue to the epidural. So Literally, a regional anesthetic and a local um, placement of a catheter were giving the patients the same amount of pain relief, the same amount of patient satisfaction. Next slide. So one more study looked at the comparison of using um, an anti-inflammatory anti diclofenac into the surgical wound over 48 hours versus 0.2% ribavicaine or saline, and what they found again, versus um, saline with the 75 milligrams IV, they found the um, di diclofenac reduced pain as well as rupivacaine and significantly reduced morphine consumption. Next slide. Um, so here we're looking at visual, visual analog scores from the previous studies, and you can see even at 12 months and 24 months later, the rupivacaine, the the group that got rupivacaine did um, better than obviously the placebo group. In the initial 12 months, the rupivacaine group did best, but when you went to you know, 24 months and 48 months out from surgery, the um, diclofenac and the rupivacaine groups did better, but the anti-inflammatory group did the best. So why is that? Why is it that when we are giving pain relief at the time of surgery, these people have better chronic pain management. And a lot of that has to do just with the, the nerve receptors and how they fire up. So if you have nerve receptors at the time of surgery that are damaged or that, and it's just kind of the, the idea of phantom pain, you know, when a, when a um, extremity is removed, when someone goes through having an amputation of an extremity, there's, they still have phantom pain at that limb even years later. And so that is one of the things that you, um, I think needs to be studied more, but certainly we're seeing clinically is that our patients definitely have less residual pain, you know, down the road. Like we've, I mean, we've even had patients say, oh, you know, I know I'm, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be having pain, but I still notice twinges of pain at my C-section at my incision site, you know, two and three years later. But since we started using the on-cue pump, I don't 
I just don't hear that as much. And then again, you know, there's all these studies I can think of that we should be doing that because I'm not really in a research practice, um, we just haven't done. But for the residents out there that are listening, if they need studies to do, one you could do as retrospectively is just, you know, asking patients about pain at the time of surgery and then going back and asking them at 12 months and 24 months. Next. So this was the analog, visual analog scores at rest. So you can see again that placebo, um, their scores were higher than any of the other ones, um, whether it was at rest or, um, I'm sorry, at rest with the rapivacaine or the diclofenac. They did not um, analyze the anti-inflammatory group at 48 months later, but again, the um, rapivacaine group did much better in terms of even at rest having less pain. Next. Any other questions? So residual pain, you can see there's a huge difference. Um, and these are the, again, these are the reasons that I really think the ONQ is a great option because we don't want patients that are needing narcotics six months from surgery or one year from surgery. We're really trying to reduce that usage of narcotics. So um, as you can see from studies looking at, you know, using rapivacaine, by, by cutting that pain pathway or the cycle that leads to the, to the brain feeling residual pain, we, we're making a difference. Next. Um, so post-operative pain management in C-sections, looking at three different methods. One group got IM oxycodone, one got the epidural infusion, and then one group got the on-Q pump. Um, they all equally received acetaminophen and ibuprofen. So those who were getting the on pump used significantly less of the opioid than the two other groups well, and had less pain. And you would expect that the oxycodone IM group would have you know, good pain relief, but they actually did not have as, as good pain relief as the infusion. And again, I think of it just from the physiologic standpoint, you're essentially numbing those nerves. You're, you're basically giving them a long acting anesthetic. So, that localized pain relief makes a big difference. Most of our patients get up, they're moving around fairly quickly, they're breastfeeding without discomfort, um, and they're you know, needing less of the oxycodone. Next slide. Dr. Samani, just quickly, you had mentioned the use of Toradol. Can you confirm how you're utilizing Toradol today? We start the Toradol um, almost immediately after surgery. In the, in the PACU, and we do 30 milligrams IVQ6 for the first 24 hours. And then we transition to ibuprofen, 600 milligrams three times a day, or 800 milligrams three times a day. So um, there's, it's, it's almost before the spinal or the epidural even wears off, they get the Toradol. Very good, thank you. Next. So, I would also think about Toradol and Rapivacaine in terms of different mechanisms for pain relief. You know, the anti-inflammatories are gonna decrease the inflammation, they're gonna help with that muscle soreness, but the anesthetic is actually going to take care of the pain receptors and essentially numb the peritoneal cavity or the subfascial space so that patients literally feel very little pain in that area. Our robotic patients, most of their pain complaints typically were shoulder pain, that they were getting that sort of referred pain rather than um, abdominal pain. You know, they, they really didn't notice the discomfort from the, from the surgery itself. So let's go to the next slide. So what the next several slides are gonna show is the actual placement I have gone to doing a single catheter placement because I really did not see that much of a difference between doing a dual catheter and a single catheter. Um, but my two partners use a dual catheter approach and they put one catheter in the peritoneal cavity and the second catheter in the subfascial space. And they find that it seems to, they, and again, we're all, we're doing, you know, we're looking at subjective criteria, but their feeling is that these patients have less pain at the incision site. Um, so they use the two catheter technique. The other change that um, you'll see that isn't shown in, this, in these videos is that originally we were putting catheters on the two different sides with the right side being the peritoneal catheter and the left side being the subfascial catheter. So we would know 
if there was issues with one or the other, or depending on where they were having pain, we could adjust the selective flow pump. Now we've gone to putting both catheters on the same side because it's a little easier for the patient. It's a little easier in terms of the um, fancy bag that they carry the pump in. So for the, um, for the placement, the, cat, the video that you'll see is a little bit different than what we're currently doing. And I think if you're gonna start doing the two catheter placement, it will be easier to put them both on the same side and just label them or know that, you know, if you're always positioning one on top of the other, that the one is for the subfascial space and then the second one is for the peritoneal space. If you consistently do the same thing, you don't have to label it. But if you don't, or if you're trying to get in the habit of it, you can always put a little, you know, a little steri strip or something on it to identify which is which. So when you get your kit, and our hospital just kind of gives us, they bring everything up, the catheter kit. Um, the selective flow pump is usually in recovery. It's in the PACU, and they'll hook it up once we get to the PACU. But what we get at the, the time of the surgery in the OR, we'll get the catheter, the six-inch needle and sheath, steri strips, the tegaderm, the 5 ml syringe, or depending on the BMI of the patient, you can order the seven and a half inch catheter, the eight inch needle and the, um, the, the longer sheath. So most of the time you can get away with the five inch for our robotic patients, definitely, um, just because of placement and we're doing it, you know, our, under laparoscopic guidance. But with the C-section patients, we're oftentimes using the longer catheter and needle because we're angling it to get it into the abdominal cavity and we want to make sure that we're not hitting any of the other you know, vital organs and or nerves or blood vessels. So um, we typically, we will use the longer one, but again, it's, it's patient dependent and it's dependent on you as a surgeon, what, which one you choose. Next slide. So after the C-section is complete, before you close the peritoneum, so you've closed your uterine inc incision, you've kind of irrigated, cleaned up, made sure that you don't have any blood clots or anything. Um, you can angle the, um, the initial sheath and needle and make sure, as you can see in this picture, that your thumb is on the end of it. If it's not, what will happen is the needle will slide back because of the resistance of tissue. And the catheter, the, the sheath itself is very flimsy, so it'll bend and you'll have trouble getting into the abdominal cavity. So always make sure your thumb is on the end of it and that you watch as you go through the layers and that you're coming in without hitting, you know, the bowel, hitting the intestines or hitting the uterus or any of the nerves. The biggest nerve that you want to avoid, obviously, is inferior epigastric. So because I'm right-handed, I end up putting it on the right side. I think if you're left-handed, you might find it easier to put on the left side, um, but it's really your preference. So we go three inches superior to the incision. Again, the closer you get to the incision, the more likely you are to then get leakage later on because that catheter isn't, ang the, the actual catheter isn't angled into the abdominal cavity. So there's more, more space for it to leak right at that incision site. So that's why we go up a little bit higher. So once we've introduced the, in the needle and the sheath through the abdominal wall, making sure that we're in the right space, we take out the needle, we leave the sheath in place. And then next slide. And then we guide the silver soaker catheter through that sheet. And again, we pull it all the way through, lay it up at the fundus. Um, there, I, when we first started using it, we had concerns about where it was placed in regards to urinary retention. But there have been studies since then that have shown that it really doesn't make a difference in terms of bladder issues or, or urinary retention. So most of the time we'll put it up above the fundus, trying to sort of wrap it so it's out of our incision and making sure that we don't catch it when we're closing the peritoneum. So once it's in there, we'll pull the black catheter tip through the opposite end of the incision. Um, and next slide. You can see it's, it's laid across the uterus and then we'll pull the T-sheath um, out of the body and peel it apart. Next. And once that's done, you can see that there's um, markers on the, within the insertion point. So you can see them externally, you can see them internally. Um, the markers are set at five centimeters. So the soaker markers, um, each segment is five centimeters. And we try to put it in as far in as we can so that you have less that you need to coil on the outside. Um, and then next slide, you'll see um, one of the slides will show there's little holes 
right along the catheter. So all of the um, repivacaine is dripping through a, a long segment of that catheter. It's not just coming out of the tip. And then we, we use um, 3 o Vicryl, but you can use whatever your suture of preference is. Close the peritoneum, make sure you don't, you don't catch that catheter in the peritoneum as you're closing it. And the benefit of closing the peritoneum is that you do um, keep that as much of that repivacaine in the abdominal cavity as possible. You just have less leaking. And then I close the fascia with Ovicryl or Luke PDS, depending on, on the patient's BMI and depending on the number of C-sections they've had. But again, that is up to you. There's, there's no reason that you have to use Vicryl. Um, standard you know, surgical procedure, if the subcutaneous layer is more than two centimeters, we close it with interrupted pop-offs and then sutures or staples. I use, exclusively use sutures, um, but I know there's um, absorbable staples and some people, their preference is staples. So it really doesn't matter. Um, I also have used the Prenio and the um, silver dressing for patients who are obese. And again, that doesn't, it's fine to use with the on cue catheter. Next. Um, so once it's coiled, we secure it with a steri strip. And then we either cover just with Tegaderm, or if you're worried about, like when your first couple placements, if you're worried about having issues with it leaking through. You can also use one of those drain um, pads that they have that have like a slit in it. And you could put that on top of the catheter itself and then put the tegaderm on top of that. So that helps to absorb some of that um, leakage. The other thing, um, since I use suture, I use exofen or dermabond. And I'll put just a tiny little bit at the site where the catheter comes out on the skin, um, along with the exofen or dermabond on the incision itself. Next, I think we're going to watch a video. You guys have a chance to listen to me on the video instead of hearing me talk live. On a single catheter placement at the time of the C-section, we initially place the introducer needle parallel to the umbilicus, about two to three inches away from the umbilicus, taking care to avoid the inferior epigastric vessels. As you can see, the needle is introduced under direct visualization, followed by threading of the catheter into the peritoneal cavity. The catheter has kept in the upper abdomen so as to avoid urinary retention and bladder dysfunction. Once the catheter is threaded into place, the sheath is then stripped to remove that. Um, the catheter is placed above the uterus or as close to the fundus as possible. This is then followed by closure of the peritoneum in a running fashion using 3 ovicral suture. The fascia is then closed with the surgeon's suture of choice, followed by closure of subcutaneous layer and the skin. Once the catheters are positioned on the patient's abdomen, the on-cue pain balls are attached to the catheters and left clamped if the patient has received Duramorph during their spinal anesthetic. On-cue pain balls are unclamped on post-op day one once the Duramorph has worn off. This allows for longer use of the on-cue pump for pain management after the surgery. So that's something that we've also changed. Um, you know, we're now going on about six, seven years of usage. And when we were doing that, it worked out well for most patients, but for some patients, the catheter would get clogged and or clotted or just, it didn't work. So we've stopped doing that and we just turn it on right away. We've also stopped, um, we've decreased, um, unless the anesthesiologist insists on using Duramorph, we usually don't use Duramorph for our patients anymore. So those are some changes, again, that we've made over time, just 
from our practical use of it. And in the past year, I'd asked my rep, and in the past year, our group used group between our OB and GYN patients used 500 on two pumps. And typically we use the 400 or 600 um, ml um, bags or balls, whatever you want to call them. And most of our patients do very well with those. Occasionally we'll have a patient request a second ball to go home with. But typically that only happens if they're running the, um, the flow at a much higher rate than we typically set it at. And we usually um, set it at four mLs per hour. Next. So we're gonna go into the um, dual catheter placement. And again, it's really nice because they package everything for you. So there's very little that you need to do in terms of knowing what to get. Um, it's all, at our hospital, it's all set up by the pharmacy. We just need to put the orders in in the pharmacy. So a 450, or um, excuse me, a 400 ml um, pump will actually hold 500 um, mLs of Pivacaine and the 600 ml ball will actually hold 750 ml. So you get more bang for your buck in the sense that it can hold more than what the, what the original description is. And so with the 400, these patients are actually getting about 500 to 550 of Repivacaine. So there's two kits. You get two catheters, you get two of the needles. Um, everything obviously is doubled. Um, and then in terms of placement, I think the next slide, or actually the next slide is just showing the visual placement. Go ahead. Dr. Simone, a question's coming in from the audience around dual catheter placements. You had mentioned that your partners are using that device specifically. Uh-huh. You mentioned about various techniques to denote which catheter is in which space, be it uh, peritoneal cavity or subfascial. Right. Has there been any evolution in terms of that marking system? So the biggest change we made, and on the video, you're going to see that we place it on the opposite sides. We'll put the um, peritoneal one on the right side, and then we'll put the subfascial one on the left side. The, the change that we made was putting them both on the same side with the peritoneal one being higher, and then the subfascial one we put below it, so that when we tape them, they're sort of underneath one um, tegaderm, essentially. They don't have two separate tegaderms. They're not separated. So, because both catheters will go to one ball. So it's not that they're carrying around two pumps or two balls. They're just carrying around the one ball in almost what looks like a fanny pack. So with both of them being attached to the same ball, when we had them on the opposite sides, it made it much harder for the patient in terms of mobility and being able to, a lot of times what they'll do now is they'll take that fanny pack and just kind of sling it over their shoulder and they can walk with it very easily. But when we, were, when we had it on two sides, it was much more difficult for them to do that. They were kind of slinging it around their neck or they were trying to put it around their waist. But when you're postpartum, that's really hard to do. So that was one of the reasons we changed to putting them on both on the same side. And then, as I said, you can, instead of wasting, you can just take um, one of your dairy strips because there's three in there. You can typically take one and just mark on there, you know, peritoneal and subfascial like SF and P so that you know which is which, so that if there is anything that you need to troubleshoot, you'll know which one you're dealing with. Okay, and just a quick question back to skin closure. You currently, from a technique standpoint, place a singular catheter and close the peritoneum. Any concerns about potentially looping your catheter or catching it with a stitch? And then if you're a clinician who is not closing the peritoneum, any reason to be concerned about using on cue? No. So if you don't close the peritoneum, that's fine. And actually, probably from the, from the standpoint of one versus two, you'll probably notice that more, you'll have more infusion of the repivacaine into the um, subfascial space or into the rectus muscle, into that area. So that is an advantage. However, the disadvantage is that if you don't close the perineum, the patient or your postpartum nurses may say that they're noticing more, that the, the dressing becomes moist. And typically they just have to change the dressing, which is not that big of a deal, but that's something that they, Unless you make sure that you explain it, they may think that it's not working correctly. 
And I always reassure them that it, if it's leaking, it's still working for them. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that you're gonna have to train, change the dressing a little more often. But yeah, you don't have to close the peritoneum. I, I think it's just out of um, routine that I've always closed the peritoneum. So I continue to do it. In all the years since 2011, I've only had one case and it was on a robotic case where the catheter got caught in the umbilical incision and I was able to, luckily, I mean, she was taking it out a couple of days later and she couldn't get it out and she came in the office and we just um, put a local anesthetic, cleaned around the umbil umbilicus and opened it up and pulled it out and then just closed it back up. So that's the only time that's ever happened to me. Um, knock on wood, it hasn't happened, but we really try to tent up the peritoneum. And I think if you don't close the peritoneum, you're even less likely to catch the catheter when you're, when you're closing your fascia, just being aware. I mean, it's kind of what you do when you're closing peritoneum. You're very aware of where your loops of small intestine are. You're trying to be aware that you're not catching that or you're not catching the, you know, the omentum. So it's sort of the same thing just being conscious and being aware. I mean, we use hemostats on the peritoneum and we kind of pull it up and away from the, from the uterus a little bit so that we know there's a gap there and we can kind of pay attention as we close it. So anything else, Mike, before I move on? No, not this time. Okay, so I will not go through these steps again, but as you can see, it's essentially the same steps as placing um, the single catheter, it's going to go in the peritoneal cavity. And once you're done closing that, then you're going to go on to um, go ahead to the next slide. So with the next, with the second catheter, you've, you've closed your peritoneum, or if you didn't close the peritoneum, you'll just go ahead and lay that catheter. Um, you'll put it in through same technique, but instead of going all the way through the abdominal wall, you're gonna just angle it so that it comes out in that subfascial space. And again, taking care to avoid injury to the vessels, you'll go ahead and lay it across your rectus muscles. And then once it's, and you'll have to kind of coil it up depending on how big you make your incision. If you're someone who makes a smaller incision, you may find that you have less space and you end up coiling it a little bit more. If you make a more generous incision, then you should have no trouble laying it across the incision with just a little bit of having to coil it underneath the, um, on top of the rectus muscles, but underneath the fascia. So same steps, you introduce the sheath, the introducer needle, you take the needle out, you thread the silver soaker catheter in through the TPL sheath. And next one. And then at that point, you can, you can see from this um, drawing that it's just laid across the rectus muscles. So we can lay it, you can see that it's up a little bit above the incision, out of the space where you're gonna um, actually close the fascia. Sometimes if you didn't dissect up that high, you may find that's a little bit closer to your fascia and you have to be a little bit more careful when you're closing it that you don't catch it inside those stitches. Next. So you, you'll close your fascia, and again, with whatever suture you want, um, irrigate the sub-Q space, close the you know, subcutaneous space if you need to, and then same steps. So you can see, as, I, as this image shows, they're on two different sides, but the reality is we have now moved it to where both of them are on the same side. So as you can see, there's two different um, dials, and then they go to a common um, a common tubing where the filter is and then they're attached to the pump. So the actual ball is just one, but you can individually adjust the dials so that you don't have to have the same rate for both of them. So we'll always start out at about four mLs per hour for both catheters, but if a patient is having more pain at the incision site, you can increase the subfascial one if they seem to be having more irritation intra-abdominally, so they're noticing more maybe of the uterine cramping or they're noticing more of the discomfort you know, in the deeper layers, then you can increase the flow rate on the, on the, um, the peritoneal catheter. Next. So we're gonna go through the video, but this is just gonna hopefully just show you the second one. <laughs> 
dual catheter placement, we are putting catheters in the intra-abdominal cavity as well as in the subfascial space to give the patient better pain management. The first catheter is placed parallel to the umbilicus and the needle is brought through under direct visualization. After the needle is positioned in place, it is removed and the catheter is threaded through into the abdominal cavity. The catheter is then placed up in the upper abdominal cavity up towards the fundus. The sheath is then removed followed by closure of the peritoneal cavity with 3-0 vicryl suture in a running fashion. After closure of the peritoneal cavity, the second catheter is placed again parallel to the umbilicus on the contralateral side. The needle is watched as it is brought through the abdominal cavity, taking care to avoid injury to the inferior epigastric vessels. After the sheath is placed, the needle is removed and the catheter is threaded through and laid across the subfascial space. The fascia is then closed with the surgeon's suture of choice, followed by closure of subcutaneous layer and the skin, again using suture of the surgeon's choice. We use 3-0 vicryl suture in an interrupted fashion for the um, subcutaneous layers that are greater than two centimeters and for a monocryl suture. Once the catheters are positioned on the patient's abdomen, the on-cue pain balls are attached to the catheters and left clamped if the patient has received Duramorph during their spinal anesthetic. Next slide, please. So the biggest benefits that we've seen are obviously the use of opioids has decreased, pain scores have improved, and much lower incidence of constipation. I mean, if you're not taking narcotics and you have a local anesthetic sort of taking care of the pain that you're having, you're gonna have less issues with your GI tract. Um, less drowsiness, and as I said, our patients are going home fairly quickly. So they go home with the pain ball, and because we go through teaching how to remove it and what they need to do and when the ball is empty, because we show them what it looks like in the office preoperatively, whether it's for surgery, for gynecologic surgery, or for C-sections. So from that standpoint, um, our patients are very well versed in it. The other thing that I love is that there is an 1-800 number they can call. There's videos online that they can watch if they're, and oftentimes patients will be like, I'm really nervous. I don't know if I can take it out. And then they come back and go, that was really easy. It's the biggest thing we emphasize is the black tip at the end. We show them the catheter ahead of time or they see it on the video so they know the length of it. And sometimes as we joke, you know, it's like a um, magician's trick. It's like one of those rabbit tricks where you pull the scarf out and it just keeps coming. And typically there's no pain to taking it out. Most patients say it just feels like a quick, you know, um, little pinch or not even that. Sometimes it's almost like, oh, it's out. You know, if, if they're afraid of taking it out and they have their partner or someone else taking it out for them, or they very rarely, they will come into the office or now we're doing telemedicine so we can just talk them through it on a, a telemedicine visit. But I, it, I've never had anybody have it break. I've never had anyone have trouble getting, other than the one patient I told you guys about. But other than that, it's never been a concern. You know, what, 
And again, it's something that's new and different. And so people are always going to be a little hesitant. So the more familiar you can make them <clears throat> prior to their surgical experience, the more comfortable they're going to be with it going home. Next slide. So this is basically, if you think about, it's an evolution in pain control. We're going from knocking out every single pain receptor in the body with the IV infusions and oral pain meds to things like an epidural or duramorph to regional nerve blocks to now incisional pain relief. And this has been used for um, trauma, for rib fractures, and the studies in that field have shown a lower incidence of PE, a lower incidence of pneumonia in patients that have the on catheter placed. Same thing in terms of orthopedics, and a much better um, mobility, easier to get up and move around, um, easier for those patients then to continue to exercise and be able to um, do the physical therapy they need to. Our um, bariatric colleagues have used this also um, inconsistently, but it is something they're using. And if you compare it to Exprel, Exprel is a very short term pain relief. So yes, it does give pain relief in the immediate sort of post-surgical period, but long-term. Um, and again, if anybody's interested in doing a study, you could do a study comparing Exprel to the on -cue and see how patients do you know, in terms of pain management. Next slide. So this is what the catheter looks like. You can see that the, um, all along the catheter, there's tiny little holes that essentially drip the anesthetic into the abdominal cavity. So again, we're placing it in a certain way, but as soon as the patient's moving around, you know that catheter is going to move a little bit, but because there's such a broad surface area, um, they're getting pain relief regardless of whether it's still in the place where you put it or it's shifted or moved around a little bit. Next slide. So why do I use it? Just like I said, because we've had positive results. We've been using it for a long time. We have seen an improvement in terms of our, our patient satisfaction scores, our patients telling us that you know, they, that was one of the best things they found, especially those who have had surgery before. They definitely notice a change or an improvement in terms of their pain management um, because we are a hotbed of opioid use. And you wouldn't know it anymore because all everybody talks about is coronavirus, but um, the opioid issues still exist and we still need to look at how we can reduce opioid use. Next slide. So for C-sections, the multimodal approach, you know, using whether you use Duramorph or not is not that critical, but the on cue fits in between the anti-inflammatories and the and as I said, I'm a big believer of scheduled Tordal. I use it preoperatively even for um, hysteroscopy patients because it helps relax the uterine tone. So if you're doing a myosure, if you're removing a fibroid, or you're doing an ablation, you're going to get less of those uterine contractions. So you're actually going to have a better result and you're going to be able to do your surgery quicker um, because you don't see those um, changes as much in terms of the intrauterine pressure. Next slide. So at this point, I know I've been talking for a long time and I really appreciate everyone's attendance. We're um, just past seven o'clock. So if people have questions, I'm happy to continue to stay on. If not, if you would like to email and um, go through your rep to have questions answered, I'm happy to go that route too. Dr. Simone, just time for one last question. There was a question about your setting, your rate on your pump specifically. Mm -hmm. what you're doing today and had that evolved over time and then ultimately how many days of relief do you see for patients yeah so um when we first started doing this we used the 100 ml ball and it did not have a dial and what was happening was those were running out usually within two days and it's funny how often things are driven by your patients questions so we were having patients that were asking, like, is there any way that I could have had that last longer? It really helped, but I feel like it would have helped a lot more if I could have had it for a few extra days. So we asked our rep at the time and found out that there were different sizes of the balls. And so that's how we started shifting into using the bigger ones. So for the two catheter, we use the 600 ml ball, and then that fills to 750. And if you set it at four mLs per hour, that will last typically about three to four days, um, sometimes five days on the single catheter. But 
as soon as you go up on it, and you can go up to 14 mLs per hour, two things happen. One, you run out of it faster. So typically it'll run out within like two, two and a half days. Um, and when you're running it at a higher rate, you're gonna be more likely to see the leakage that I was talking about. So their, their dressing's gonna, and, and again, if you prepare people for that, it's fine. Um, we've had, like I said, a handful of patients that have requested a second ball to go home with. And luckily our pharmacy is very um, amenable to that. So far, nobody said, oh, that's too expensive or we can't do that. So we've been fortunate in that respect. But I think that's something, again, that depends on the hospital and the pharmacy and how they manage it. Um, but yeah, uh, the rate, the reason we went with the four is that at the, the original pumps were up to seven mLs and that was right in the middle. So we started with that and we had some flexibility to move up. Great. And then the final question, I promise. Uh, one came in. I know this talk has been largely around your practice related to C-section and the use of on cue. You mentioned your robotic hysterectomies as well. Anything from a patient selection standpoint that you consider, uh, are there patients that just absolutely are not candidates from your perspective uh, to, to receive the therapy uh, or any other contraindications that you consider as you look at, at patients under your care? Yeah, so um, the only patients that I would say would be a contraindication would be someone who's allergic to the anesthetics. And that's happened to me once in since 2011, I've had one patient who was allergic to the amides and the esters. So that was really tough because when she delivered, she had a vaginal delivery and I was like praying to God she would not have a tear. And luckily she didn't because I was sort of like, what am I going to sew her up? What am I going to use? You know, this is going to be impossible. Um, so she was, that was a tough case in the sense that um, I, am, I went on to do a hysterectomy on her a few years later, and we did not use the on cue pump for her. Um, we couldn't, I mean, I typically inject my incisions with Marcane, like quarter percent Marcane, before I even make the incisions on the robots. And I was unable to do that too. But she, she did surprisingly well. I mean, she was, again, you know, she's a nurse and she was one of those patients who didn't want to take narcotics. So, um, she did well with, we obviously gave her the IV toward all for 24 hours and then sent her home. And she did, I mean, it's not that she didn't use narcotics, but um, I was surprised. I thought she would have more pain than, than she did. Um, so that is probably the only absolute contraindication I can think of. I've operated, I've done robot cases on patients with a BMI of 70 and we've been able to put a catheter in. We've had no issues with putting it in on those patients. Um, I think it's absolutely the ideal choice for someone who is had a history of addiction or is currently being treated for addiction um, for our chronic pain patients who I think you've all had this experience where they tell you, I'm allergic to this, I'm allergic to this, I'm allergic to, and, you know, I can only take Dilaudid or I can only take, you know, morphine tablets. I mean, those are the patients that I'm, I'm always encouraging them to try the on -cue pump. Because again, when you knock out those nerves and you knock out the actual source of where the pain is, unless there's secondary gain to the pain, um, they usually do very well with the, with the on cue pump. Great. And that's all the questions we have, Dr. Samani. I just want to say on behalf of the medical education team, thank you so much for your presentation this evening. Thank you. And for all the listeners out there, I really appreciate your time and for listening to this presentation. Thank you very much. On behalf of Avanos, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.